We have a return guest today on Real Wealth, Gibran Nicholas, CEO of CMPS Institute, an organization that has trained, coached, and certified over 7,000 of the nation's top financial and housing professionals since 2005. He has taught continuing education to mortgage originators, real estate agents, attorneys, insurance agents, financial planners, and CPAs. He has recently launched a new publication, The Economic Trend Spotter, a market intelligence and content service that helps keep people up to date on what's going on here in the United States as well as abroad. Welcome, Gibran. Thanks for having me on the show, Jim. I appreciate it. It's been a long time since we had you on. I know you're involved in a lot of things. And the last time we had you on, we talked a little bit about real estate and the things you can do to find an ethical professional. And you were trying to help set some standards in the industry. And I know you've got a lot of different projects going on. And right now, you've got a couple newsletters that you send out, one about the real estate trend spotter. You've got an economic trend spotter. And recently, you had a couple articles that we saw. And And I thought it would be of interest to our audience. And being that I met you through real estate, I'd like to talk a little bit about real estate to start out. And then we'll talk about some of the economic trends that are going on that people might want to consider when whether buying a house or whether making investments or what to look for as we go forward. So let's talk a little bit about real estate. Before we started the program, we were talking a little bit about millennials. One thing that I've seen is, and I've seen this in the housing market in my area, I don't know if this is the same nationally, but it seems as though the millennials are not buyers of things. They seem to lease cars. They rent their apartments. They don't seem to want to be committed for much more than the next several weeks. And I see that as going to be a problem for the baby boomers that are retiring and want to sell their homes, that we don't have a generation ready to buy them. What have your thoughts or what have you seen nationwide as far as the trends that are happening with millennials and home ownership? Well, Jim, you're absolutely right in that the millennial generation is taking a lot longer to become homeowners than any of the previous generations when they were of a similar age. But the silver lining, I guess you could say, in that is that Over the next five years, it's expected that an additional 30 or 40 million households are going to form, and these people are going to need a place to live. Most of these households are going to be the millennials currently who are forming their own households over the next five years. So whether they form a household and choose to rent or whether they choose to purchase a home, it's going to be good for the housing industry because of the fact that these people will need a place to live. And I think whenever you have a greater demand for something, the price of it tends to go up. And the same is true with houses. When you have a large demand for houses, especially what we're going to see over the next five years, I think we're going to see an uptick in home prices. Now, I know we've seen a tremendous growth in rental units. I'm in Wisconsin. I'm a little ways away from Milwaukee. But I know the last time I was in Milwaukee, I noticed a tremendous amount of rental units going up and a great transformation of the old warehouse district turning into high rent district apartments. And I've traveled around the country and it seems like the same thing is happening in other cities. I was just at a conference in New Orleans, and it seems like there's, since the hurricane, there's been a rebirth of housing there. I've been to Cleveland. I've been to Texas. And you see all these areas where new apartment complexes are being built. So there's been a skyrocketing and growth in rental units. How is that going to impact perhaps individual investors? Is that the next bubble, or is that still something that's going to continue to grow with what you just talked about with the millennials? Well, I think that it's going to continue to grow. In fact, the increase in the number of rental units in the last couple of years has been primarily in single-family homes, believe it or not. And so we're just now starting to see some of those new construction projects with the lofts and the condos and the apartments are starting to now to market over the next year or two. In the past couple of years, it's been mostly single-family homes that has caused the uptick in housing rental units. I think a lot of that reason has been the fact that the homeownership rate in our country has gone down from about 70% down to around 65%. So the people who were owning a home decided to start renting 
which caused a very large demand in single-family homes. Now it seems that as these millennials begin forming new households, their needs are going to be different. Whether they are single is going to be a different housing need than if they have children. And if they have children, then perhaps as they begin growing older, then single-family rental units, I think, will be a large part of their decisions because then they can choose which school district they want to go into and so forth. But for the meantime, in the next couple of years, as most of the generation is still younger, I think a lot of the loft projects, the condo projects, the apartment buildings are going to experience an increase in demand because of the lifestyle benefits of living in some of these housing units. Now, let's transition to another part of this. And this really surprised me when I saw that one of the more recent trends is that one third of home buyers are paying cash. Now, this just amazes me. I just locked into a 30-year rate. My wife and I, after becoming empty nesters, we bought our more of our retirement home, and the interest rate that we are paying is like three and three-eighths. And with that low of interest rates, and we got lucky, we got real close to the very, very bottom When I went to the bank, I'm like, give me as much of that rate as you're willing to give me. So it kind of surprises me in some of the lowest interest rates ever that one-third of home buyers are paying cash. I don't understand that. Well, it's really an anomaly, and I think one of the main reasons is because it's very paperwork intensive these days to get a mortgage. With the way that the new regulations have been written, it's almost like the government is making people jump through many different hoops to get a mortgage. Not that you can't really qualify, but if you apply for a mortgage, chances are you can qualify. It's just that you're going to have to create a lot of different paperwork for that process. And if you have money, a lot of times you'd rather not go through that process because it just becomes a drag on your time and energy. And so I think that's one of the trends that we've seen is A lot of people are choosing to pay cash, but it just doesn't make sense from a financial standpoint because when you think about, even in the case of a $400,000 mortgage, if the spread between the mortgage rate and what you could be earning on an investment, let's just say the spread's only 2%. On a $400,000 mortgage, you're talking about $8,000 a year, which you could be putting into a college savings plan for maybe your grandchildren or the retirement plan. or I mean, that's a lot of money over time. And I think that if you have the choice whether to pay cash or whether to use a mortgage, I think it does a lot of benefit to sit down with a financial advisor and run the numbers. You know, before you make a decision one way or the other, just run the numbers and find out, you know, for your situation, would it make sense to pay cash or would it make sense to use a mortgage? One thing to even consider in all that is sometimes there's a disconnect. Knowing that the house is paid for a lot of times gives people a sense of maybe accomplishment, but more of a safety factor. And the thing is, there's a disconnect. How much of a mortgage you have does not reflect on what the actual value of the house is. It might reflect the net value, but your house can go up or down in value regardless of whether you have a mortgage. And what I look at is trying to keep those financial decisions more independent of each other. It's just a matter of how you're going to pay for something. It's the same thing I have a lot of clients ask me, should I pay cash for a car? And my answer is, well, if they got rebates that more than justify paying cash, you might do that. But more often than not, in today's low interest environment, a lot of times you can get 0% interest. Why would you prepay something when there's no cost of borrowing? It's that time value of money and having control and the flexibility sometimes needs to be weighed out. So it's a different situation for everybody. And obviously, you should consult your advisors on that and your tax advisor. I know another thing that's happening is with itemized deductions these days. And this might be a reason why more people are paying cash, I'm seeing more and more people that aren't able to take advantage of itemized deductions because the thresholds have gotten higher with some of the changes in the tax law, and that might have an impact on it. You still want to weigh out your options. Don't just go into something and say, this is the only way. Hey, we're going to take a short break, and we come back. Let's look at some other economic trends. With us is Gibran Nicholas. He's been an expert in real estate, and he has provided a lot of education tools to both financial and real estate professionals to help them be better advisors to their clients. Please stay tuned. I'm Boomer Esiason. You know, many people don't realize the road to becoming an MVP quarterback and sportscaster wasn't always that easy. My mom died when I was just seven and our family's life changed in an instant. All the responsibilities for supporting us financially and taking care of our family fell right onto my dad's shoulders. 
And of course, there were times we relied on neighbors and relatives to help us through. And I know that things would have been so much different had my mom had life insurance. And that's why I made getting life insurance a priority when I got drafted into the pros. It gives me peace of mind knowing that if something does happen to me, my family will be okay financially. But today, 95 million adult Americans don't have this financial safety net. By sharing my story, I hope more people will think about not leaving their family's future to chance. Let's face it, folks, life happens. To learn more about life insurance and how to protect your loved ones, visit lifehappens.org. A public service message from Life Happens, a nonprofit organization. Welcome back as we continue to visit with Jabron Nicholas. And before the break, we were talking about a lot of different real estate trends that I know some of these just seem counterintuitive to me, like people that are paying cash for homes at just about all-time low borrowing rates. It kind of strikes me that people would pay cash, but it's amazing a third of Americans are doing just that. Let's talk a little bit about elder care, long-term care. We have 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring, and I don't know what you've seen, Gibran, but I think a lot of people are kind of in a state of denial when it comes to the need for long-term care, at least having a plan. And most people have this preconceived notion of years and years ago when nursing homes were the only alternative, and basically they were old age homes. Well, today with medical technology, the quality of lives for us as we get older has never been better. And the care settings that people go to to receive the care, you've never had, from what I've seen, more options. What do you see happening in the cost of elder care and with those trends, what are you recommending that people do? That's a really great question, Jim, because as you said, I mean, people are are living a lot longer, but with that comes the the cost of financing our living expenses, especially as we age. We have health issues that need to be considered. So one of the things that we're seeing a lot of these days is in-home care, and it costs a lot of money to do these types of things. For instance, having adult health care, according to some of the latest GenWorth cost of care surveys, you're looking at about $18,000 a year for that. Adult day health care, you're looking at another $43,000 a year for an assisted living facility, $91,000 a year for a private home and a nursing home. So these types of things add up. And I think what we're seeing is in the past, we've seen a reluctance for people to really talk about these types of things beforehand and really plan accordingly. But now we're reading about it in the media and really hearing about these things. People are starting to become more open and comfortable talking about what are we going to do as mom and dad age and how are we going to care for them and who's going to fund it? And so as you begin having these types of conversations, I think having certain conversations about cash flow becomes even more important. So for instance, one of the things we talked about earlier was the fact that folks are paying cash for homes. Well, rather than paying cash for a home and just looking at it in the context of just a financial decision, why don't we look at it in also the context of a cash flow planning process? What we're seeing is a lot of folks are starting now to consider reverse mortgages. Once you turn age 62, you're eligible to qualify for a reverse mortgage. What that means is that you don't have to have a mortgage payment after age 62. And so if you already have a mortgage going into retirement, you might want to consider refinancing into a reverse mortgage so that you eliminate the payment without having to necessarily dip into your investments so that now you could finance some of these elder care issues that crop up, not only for yourself, but for parents who may be aging and living longer. Just recently, we had a gentleman as a guest that has spoken all around the country, and he had a unique company where not only do they do consulting work, but they almost work like a general contractor, helping people to make their house safe. And it was interesting. One of the stories that he shared was a situation with a gentleman who was in his 90s. His wife was in her 70s, and his wife was a very frail person from the standpoint of she, I guess, was maybe 120. 25 pounds dripping wet and he was maybe 250 pounds and he got to the point where he had problems with mobility and they did not want to go to the nursing home. They had very limited means. They were facing maybe going on Title 19 and being in a Title 19 facility and they got involved and now with technology they were able to set up a lift system that would allow the wife to take care of her husband and bring him home and one thing that I think would be important for anybody listening to consider, most people just ignore 
entrepreneur, as you mentioned, Gibran, most people just say, it ain't going to happen to me. It only happens to the neighbors. Someday I'm just going to fall peacefully in my wife's arms and we'll never need long-term care. Well, the reality is a very large percentage of the retirement community will be facing that in their lifetime. I know I've seen statistics that say if you make it to 65, it's about a coin flip whether or not you're going to need long-term care in your lifetime. If you're looking to transition your living situation, you know, my wife and I, when we looked at the house that we had, everything is pretty much on one floor and there's not a lot of steps except to go to lower level, but there was a wide staircase. So we could put a lift system in there. We're thinking of expanding a patio that we had. And one of the contractors came in and talked about maybe doing a dual level with some steps. Well, I don't think I want to put steps in there. After having this guest on, I'm starting to think, well, well, maybe we need to build it with safety in mind for our future. And I think more and more people should be realistically addressing that, especially if they're going to be making an investment in something as big as a house. And if they're like one third of Americans and tying up all their cash in it, maybe they want to make sure it's going to be a house they can stay in if their care needs change down the road. Absolutely. I mean, I think that these types of things should really be talked about ahead of time so that you're not in a bind when it actually happens. I mean, just something like Alzheimer's disease. I mean, one out of every eight Americans over the age of 65 has it. And it's a huge issue in our country right now. And I think if we can plan for it ahead of time, at least from a financial standpoint, now we've taken one less thing that we have to worry about off the table because, I mean, it's a very emotionally trying experience for folks as they age. It's not fun to age. And I think that if we could make it easier to do that by planning for it ahead of time, not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones. Nobody really wants to be a burden on their family or friends. So I think one of the things we can do to avoid that as we age is to really plan for it financially and to think about these types of things and say, okay, maybe we should consider using this strategy versus that strategy. And that's really where a consultation with a financial planner really helps, a financial professional who can help you really evaluate what your options are so that you don't feel like you're forced into one decision or another. And you know, this gentleman that we had on, one of the things he talked about too is you could have something that's ADA approved, but it may not be a fit because whoever your caregiver is, if they have some limitations, that should also be considered. So the thing that I think is just as important as the financial part is having a realistic assessment of what help and support systems are available to you outside just the money. Because if you don't have a lot of family support or a spouse that can help out, you may be facing much more significant financial burdens in the future than if you have those teams of support in place. So it is something that is probably one of the most impactful considerations in retirement, and it's probably the least considered, speaking from experience. Hey, let's shift gears and let's wrap up with one thing that's been in the news a lot lately, and that's Greece. And I know Greece, their whole economy is smaller than my state of Wisconsin, and I know the population is smaller than metropolitan Los Angeles. Yet, when we listen to the news, it sounds like Greece is the most important thing in the world economically, and that it's going to have a huge impact on everybody, depending on what happens. What's your take on it, Gibran? Well, we live in a global economy these days, and the thing about Greece, if it were in its own independent sort of isolated incident, it really wouldn't have that big of a ripple effect on the rest of the world. But because it's part of the Eurozone, a lot of folks are concerned with the ripple effects that could potentially happen when countries in that block of the Eurozone, if they were to go into default on their debt. And Greece isn't the only country in that region that has financial challenges. Whenever a country owes as a matter of its national debt, if it owes anything above, say, 100% of its gross domestic product, and gross domestic product is basically a measurement of the size of the economy. So what's the total value of the goods and services that are sold in the economy? If a country owes to its creditors anything more than 100% of the total size of its economy, like it's, it's called a debt-to-GDP ratio, it becomes a cause for concern. And so Greece isn't the only country in that region that has high debt ratios. You have Italy, you have Spain, even France and Germany are nearing 100% debt-to-GDP ratio. So Italy and Spain are over 100% debt-to-GDP ratio. And so when you have a country like Greece, it becomes a scenario where investors in the market become concerned with what happens if this type of thing happens to other countries in the same region? How is it going to impact 
currency? How is it going to impact the economy? And then, of course, how is it going to impact the United States and our economy because we do a lot of trade and a lot of business with Europe? And so I think what we're seeing in the market is basically a reassessment of risk. How are investors looking at the risk of how risky is it to invest in the stock market versus how risky is it to invest in the bond market? So when you have news coming out of Greece that's very positive, investors become joyous and they decide that hey, listen, we're more comfortable now taking risks because the world is a much safer place. And so they start investing in stocks and it drives stock prices higher. But when there's news coming out of Greece that's negative, then, oh, the end of the world is happening. And so now investors decide to sell their stocks and they buy bonds instead. And so you see a decline in stock prices, but then bond prices go higher, which drive interest rates lower. And so I think that the seesaw effect that we're seeing out of Greece is really impacting people's retirement accounts in the sense that when there's good news out of Greece, it's going to drive your retirement account lower, but your interest rates are going to also go lower because bond prices are going to be higher to account for that. And the opposite takes place when there's positive news coming out of Greece. I think the moral of the story is don't go it alone. A lot of times people will overreact or underreact based on a situation that happens in the news. And obviously, the news doesn't report a lot of good stories. It seems to focus on the negative, and the more negative, the better. I think I've heard one reporter explain it as if it bleeds, it leads. So there's a lot of bad news being promoted. If you have a retirement strategy that fits for you, you can't get wrapped up in these stories. It's important to discuss it, but I wouldn't overreact to it without getting some advice from your professionals and making sure you're making the right decisions based on your own particular circumstances. Don't get the advice in the lunchroom. Hey, Gibran, this has been great. Any parting thoughts? I'd like to just echo what you just said. I mean, the world these days is a much more dangerous place from a financial standpoint. There's a lot more things to consider now than there ever have been in the past. And it's really important to work with a certified professional, someone who's really qualified to help you evaluate some of your decisions. You know, when it comes to the financial planning implications of your decisions, then you should really speak with a financial advisor. When it comes to the tax planning implications, you should speak with a tax advisor. When it comes to the mortgage planning implications of your decisions, one of the things that we like our listeners to consider is talk to a certified mortgage planning specialist, someone who is really certified to help you evaluate what your options may be in light of your overall financial situation. And so you can find a CMPS professional, a certified mortgage planning specialist. If you go to the website, it's called homeqb.com. It's spelled home QB as like the quarterback QB and it's homeqb.com and you can search for a certified mortgage planner in your area and they can help you evaluate what some of the decisions may be, some of the options that may be available to you if you're considering whether you should pay cash or whether you should use a mortgage or what some of the options may be available to you as you consider your housing decisions. Again, it's been a pleasure having you, Gibran. You're a wealth full of information and look forward to having you again real soon. Well, thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us this week. And tune in again next week as we explore another phase of the real wealth process. And remember, if anything you heard in today's show you'd like to get more information about, contact your Real Wealth Advisor. Also, if you feel that any of this information would be helpful to a friend or family member, just click the Forward to a Friend button.